Brought to you by five guys who haven't reached third base. This is the Radio Scouts podcast with John, Mike, Andrew, Alan, and Nick. This week, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special episode of the Radio Scouts podcast. On with us tonight, Northwest League Pitcher of the Year for 2018, Josh Winkowski. All right. Okay. So before we start, um, I know how to pronounce your last name, but I'm just wondering how you pronounce your last name. Uh, Winkowski. (laughs) I told you. Uh, Alan, tell tell him how you pronounce his name. You've betrayed Poland. The great nation of Poland is very upset. It's Winskowski, no? No, sadly no. Yeah, that was my uh, that was my first connection with Jim Sykowski, uh, the Vancouver pitching. Company. I wish it sounded a little bit more exotic too. So this is so episode... starting with a whimper. Yeah, well, this yeah. is episode twelve. <laughs> Episode 12 of the Radio Scouts podcast. We've actually made it to 12 episodes. That's awesome. Oh, wow, that's a lot. So we're just going to keep it nice and loose. We don't, uh, I mean, obviously you're a gamer. We got you online here. You're playing CSGO. So yeah, I was playing real quick before uh, we got into the... You don't play Fortnite, do you? Uh, I really never got into Fortnite. Big COD Woo! guy on the PS4. Okay, so Blackout then for sure. I uh, got into Blackout as of late, but uh, traditionally more of a multiplayer guy. Only that's losers fine. play Fortnite. That's you know that's mostly true, yeah. So Josh, what is it that you love so much about Milk? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, it just it was like it was like twelve thirty at night last night, and uh, one of my goals this off season is to put on weight. Um, and I'm a big cereal guy, so we were out of milk, and I couldn't make cereal <laughs> for a late night. It's one of the first things you do uh, when you make the major leagues and you're making big money to buy a dairy farm. Could could be in the plans for sure. <laughs> I'm sensing some very big endorsement deals in your future for cereal. So what what's your go to? Reese's Puff are a big one. Cocoa Puffs, um, Frosted Flakes, Cinnamon Toast Crunch is huge. That's a good uh, list. I actually like Life a lot. The uh, Cinnamon and Regular Life is really good. What's your opinion on bagged milk? Uh, never tried it. I've also heard of box milk. I think that's a little. Yeah. If you, if you, when you get to Toronto, I know that a lot of people have uh, been complaining about the way we sell milk, and I don't really understand why we do it that way. But yeah, when I was there, in, when I was in Vancouver this year, my host family bought like uh, almond milk all the time. And I was like, I kind of need regular milk. I'm sorry. Cause I'm mostly going to eat cereal at your house. So. All right. So, okay. So we'll start with the actual question. So in the 2016 draft, you had a commitment to Florida Southwestern state college. From what I read, you'd hope for a little bit more money from the team, but well, uh, what ultimately pushed you to sign, uh, with the Jays? Uh, right. that's probably, that's probably one of my, the hardest decisions I've ever made. I think I flip-flopped like six or seven times between signing and not signing. And at one point, I was actually signed up for my classes to go to uh, FSW. Um, FSW was a good commitment, but I don't think it was. It wasn't like the dream commitment. So um, I think like the option to just go get my big league career out of high school um, and have some of the benefits of being a high schooler, I think, uh, kind of tilted tilted me towards uh, signing. How big of a commitment was it, or how big of a factor was it that the Jays um, are committing to pay for eight semesters of school in, you know, in the future? Yeah, that was a pretty big deal. I mean, obviously, uh, best case scenario, I'd make the big leagues in three or four years, but um, some things are out of your control with injuries or just not per, just straight up not performing. So I think having having school as a, a second opportunity was pretty huge. Uh, did you know how long before the, they drafted you? Did you know, like, was it from the start of the draft? Did they contact you, uh, let you know that they were interested or, uh, they called me, 
they called uh, my area scout told me to stay by my phone right around like the eight to ten round range um and then obviously that day passed um and then nothing happened early on the last day um so i was kind of just hanging out and then i actually my travel ball coach is a uh scout for the colorado rockies uh john cedarberg and he he was actually the first one to let me he kind of texted me said congratulations and i was really confused i was like what <laughs> <laughs> so the Blue Jays actually weren't the first people to let me know that they had drafted me, which is kind of funny. Oh, that's interesting. That's actually going to be my uh, my next follow up on that was if uh, which other teams showed interest. Um, I think there there was like six or eight um, really small interests. Obviously, just like a few uh, pre draft things, and then um, some other like questionnaires and stuff. But I think. Uh, I I threw a pre pen for the Blue Jays and then the Cubs guy, uh, the Cubs area scout and myself were in communication a lot. So I think like the top two teams were the Jays and the Cubs. Uh, were you expecting to go in the general area where you were picked? Um, thinking back, um, my my agent and I we really weren't sure what to expect. Um, going into the draft, I kind of, um, FSW was like my only. Com- commitment and that even came halfway through my senior year so um i go from questioning if i'm going to play college ball to draft talk so i think going into the draft like i was kind of curious like how am i going to get drafted i could barely find a college to be honest so um i wasn't really sure what to expect but the 15th round i think um out of 40 i think was definitely a little bit higher than i expected personally josh did your stuff like spike up in your senior year or something like that um it's i kind of think about this back a lot i really don't um the travel team that i played for i don't think really did the best to expose me as a junior late junior year i was up to 91 um and then i was up to 90 91 a lot in tournaments um and then my senior year i was up to like 93 and was sitting 89 93 and then my senior year is when my, my slider really started to come into like 85 86 touching 87 at times and i think that's what really for like the pro guys is what really did it. I, I kept hearing, if you can throw your slider that hard, you'll definitely throw your fastball harder. So, I saw in a news article that you said something about the Jays developing power righties and like helping you appreciate that they picked you. Which guys were you thinking about when you said that? Um, San- Sanchez was always a big one. Um, I know they had, I know they didn't obviously complete Syndergaard's development, but I know they drafted him early on. Um, or drafted him and then had him for his first couple years. So just guys like that. Um, and then thinking back, there's a few other guys I'm sure I was thinking of. I just can't remember. Right. Yeah, those are definitely the two most prominent names that came before you, though, would be Sanchez and Syndergaard, right? Yeah, Osuna was another one I remember. Because um, I remember talking to some people like early on, he was – I mean, he was always a really good pitcher, but he took took huge strides through uh through the system. Osuna was like a fat, chubby kid when they when he was you know low in their system, and he turned into something completely different. Yeah, he uh, he was pretty chubby, and then I can't remember what the injury was, but talking to some of the coaches, he injured something, and then after the injury, he got in really good shape and just started throwing really. Maybe he broke his jaw. That would have helped a lot. That, would, that, that, that one didn't land. <laughs> no, that's uh, <laughs> swinging a miss. I, I, wow. All right, John, edit that out. I <laughs> laughed. I just didn't push the talk. <laughs> I actually thought it was yeah. a good joke, but that's kind of me. So now that you've got a few, you know, you've got experience in the, in the professional minor league ball, how does that compare to high school, like, overall? Is there, like, a huge difference in coaching focus? Um, I had a really, I was really fortunate. Um, Gary White was my high school coach and he spent a little bit of time in pro ball and the minors himself with the Orioles. So I think he, uh, he gave me a little bit more than you're going to get from most high school coaches. He kind of had me prepared as to what to expect and kind of how, kind of how to go about my things. Um, but still living it day to day is definitely different. Um, and then like, obviously all the, all the coaches that I've come across with the Blue Jays have just been a ton of help and they each kind of do give you different things. So I think it's just like the quantity of coaches you have instead of in high school and college, you maybe have like a point of view, one or two from a coach or two where in pro ball, you can 
I mean, like you're an extended and you have like three or four different put pitching coaches all giving you input. I think that's a huge help. Any, anything specific that the Jays have you work on, like like specific exercises or specific things that that'll help develop your pitches further? Um, I kind of traditionally have uh, struggled with my hips get really tight and then a big tight hamstring guy. So um, I think on on like a daily basis, I'm always I have a whole bunch of drills and exercises I do to loosen those up. And uh, I started to get those really loose at the end of Vancouver, and I could I could feel it on my pitching, um, just getting over the ball a lot better and locating better. So, and it, it, it's, is it something they focus on like one small thing at a time, or did are you like taking giant strides from from one thing to the next with with the drills or what have you that they give you? Honestly, they don't uh, they don't have a lot for me when it comes to like mechanics and different stuff. I think. Um, the focus, uh, with me and coach Sikowski this year was pretty much just like the mental side of the game and approaching different hitters and, uh, sequencing and different stuff. So I don't, we didn't really talk about mechanics all of that much, that much this year. It was just kind of like on the mental side of, and, and so for, to a certain degree, you can kind of understand that, right? Like if it's not broke, don't try to fix it. Right. If it's working for you, why change it? Yeah, no, I agree for sure. Uh, I think. Um, you know, the difference between Bluefield and Vancouver, um, probably the stuff was a little bit better, but I think it started from just being mentally stronger and having a, a different approach to the game. And how big a difference is it like the mental preparation from, from high school to now? Like you said, you're on a travel team. So obviously you, you've got a, anybody that really gets drafted out of high school is probably on the travel team playing against really high level, you know, other kids that are going to get drafted. So what's what's kind of the big difference in mental prep from high school to now? Uh, I think for me, obviously you have um, you have bad outings in travel ball in high school, but I think um, in pro ball when you start having two or three or four, uh, especially in blue field, um, three or four bad outings in, bad outings in a row, um, I think that's been the biggest mental adjustment for me is just being able to reset it, even though you've struggled for a couple outings in a row. Um, and just getting back on track. Josh, you mentioned one of your coaches, but does the organization have like specialists or people who specifically only do the mental side of things that kind of roam around or stay with the clubs? Yeah, we have, uh, we've made a lot of changes and even dietitians and uh, mental performance. We have like whole sections for them now. Um, and we have three or four different uh, mental performance people that are available to you at any time um and there was there's definitely that definitely helped me out a lot this year um especially spending there was pretty much one there all the time extended and being able to talk to them two or three times a week was a huge help for sure they have like a whole specialized uh section in the org available to all the players and how did they feel about uh your cereal consumption your cocoa puffs <laughs> Uh, the nutritionists don't love it, but um, it is what it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a non-negotiable. Yeah, that's it. Can't have you know what? CC Sabathia. CC Sabathia was a was an ace, and his uh, his non-negotiable was Captain Crunch. So <laughs> sometimes you just can't tell him what to do. You have to stick with what works, right? Oh yeah, cereal is definitely uh, a comfort area for me. So. Josh if the Jays had told you that you can't, if you can't eat cereal, would you have chosen to go to college? I mean, with how close I was, probably yeah. <laughs> That's right. I can see it now. Josh Winkowski, cereal it. killer. Perfect. <laughs> like think, thinking, thinking back to uh, that summer, I'm pretty sure. I think like the deadline to sign was like January or. Um, July 15th, and I think I signed on July 11th, so I think that's how close it actually was. Oh, Josh, yeah. what type of uh, data at this point in your career, like, are the, your coaches and the organization feeding you and, you know, getting you to look at? Is it stuff like spin rate or high-level mechanical stuff, or is that kind of not on your plate yet? Um, one, one thing I really enjoy this extended, um, we brought in David Ardsma and he started to bring some of the, the, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, the rap Soto. Um, yeah. we started to throw pens with that behind us and it would kind of show me some of the different numbers with my slider and my four seam. 
Um, and I actually changed, I changed my forcing grip. Um, instead of having a horseshoe on the on my left in, index finger, um, I had the seams, uh, the horseshoe to the right of my middle finger. Um, and for whatever reason, that that get a, that got a lot more carry on the ball and a little bit more run. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. If you can visualize that. So just a simple simple change in my forcing grip of just moving the ball like half a turn. Um, I could just hitters, – hitters just got completely different reads on my forcing this year. Um, and then I'm a guy that – like my slider sometimes would get up to 90 this year. Um, and I think uh, seeing the Rapsodo um, kind of made me more comfortable with – being okay with throwing like an 85 86 mile an hour one that was just a little bit deeper and had a little bit more movement so seeing the numbers behind it was definitely a big help yeah um does anyone anyone else didn't know that david ardsma retired uh i saw <laughs> I, I, I saw some like stuff on twitter about him being retired but i had just seen him like a week or two before so i was a little bit confused i was like i don't know so he's like yeah, he, full-on retired wait. Yeah. Oh, he's like part-time player, part-time coach for like two different teams. Breaking news, David Ardsman retired. <laughs> you heard it here first. So when you're talking about run on the four seam, you're talking about like horizontal cutting in a bit to a righty? Yeah, a little run away, running into a, a righty and away from a left. So like two seam action almost. Yeah, uh, kind of weird though. If I go, if I go into righties, it runs, but then going into lefties, I notice I would get a little bit cut. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that was kind of like the biggest thing of being in Vancouver this year was I just never. I think if I threw like 90 pitches in a game, I think like maybe five would have been close to the middle of the plate. I just felt like I never gave hitters something to hit. I feel like I was always nibble in the corners, just running it off the plate. What's your approach? Like, are you a fastball first guy, keep it down, like traditional approach? Uh, that is one of the numbers that they threw at me. I think I had, I can't remember what my ground ball rate in Bluefield was. I remember it was pretty high, but I remember in Vancouver, I had like a 55 or 60% ground ball rate. Um, and I think just like all pitchers, sometimes I want to be a big strikeout guy and strike out double digits each game. But, um, well, you did that pretty good. Like, yeah, Sadkowski this year tried to get me to be okay with throwing three pitches or less and just rolling them over to short or something like that, um, which definitely towards the end of the year I got a little bit more comfortable with and then just like when I needed strikeouts, being able to go and get them. Yeah, I mean, your ground ball rate was way up and it didn't seem to hurt you in actually getting strikeouts at the end of end of the day because your, your numbers were great. Yeah, for sure. I remember... Uh, yeah, there was a lot of times I'd give up like leadoff doubles in the sixth or seventh and then just strike out the next two or get a ground ball and strike out the next two pretty much with ease. And that's kind of what I knew. It was like, oh, wow, I'm really, really in this. So uh, these these changes that um, they went through, like uh, with your different grips and stuff, has that added velocity uh, to your four seam or is it just really movement? And kind of what do you sit at right now in a game? And do you do you can you hold it, uh, you know, until the sixth or seventh inning? Uh, I think my I think my best velocity game this year was like one to six, sitting four. Uh, most games I would settle in that ninety ninety five range, but I would only throw like two or three at ninety, and they were usually like two o three o pitches. Um, but I think the thing with that new grip, it was almost the effort level didn't have to be as hard to throw as harder, so it was like easier to throw strikes with ninety two ninety three. Um, where in years past, I would kind of have to put a little bit more effort in and then obviously lose some location. Um, but yeah. So so this the, the grip change happened when you moved to Vancouver? Um, it was kind of like in the middle of extended, we found it. And then I saw a lot of the success with it in extended. Like I said, some of the some of the swings or takes, like I would, I'd throw a fastball right down the middle and kids were taking it. And I was like, it's been a long time since I've had that happen. Um, oh. Like this isn't, there's got to be something behind it. So um, halfway through extended, I caught on to it and then kind of just carried it through to Vancouver. And then going back to the uh, velocity late in the game, sometimes I think that is one of my strengths. And that's why I hope I can stay as a start. I really don't lose velocity if not, 
gain. Um, like when I hit 93 in high school, I hit it two different games. And I think each time it was like in the fifth or sixth inning. Um, so I think usually as the game goes on, I kind of start throwing a little bit harder sometimes. So kind of like Justin Verlander then. Yeah, he's a he's a guy I like, or hopefully can compare myself to one day. I don't I don't think my well, stuff. We'll, co- we'll yet, compare. But... Yeah, we'll compare you now. <laughs> Justin Verlander comp, Josh Winkowski. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If only if only I had his twelve six, that'd be pretty nice. Well, you... speaking of that. Oh, sorry, John. No, I was going to say the exact same question that you're about to. So I okay. guess I'll just do it now. So yeah, you're, right. you mentioned your slider. So is is there other Ospi that you're working on to, to complement the repertoire fully? Like what other what other pitches are you working on? Um, pretty much my off season goal. I have two of them. Work on the change up, slow that down a little bit because that gets caught in that same range as my slider of like 85, 86. So then I usually end up having all my pitches within eight to nine, ten miles an hour. Um, so that's my main goal. But one thing I do like about my slider is to lefty, um, to lefties, I do get it down, um, almost 12, six more. I wouldn't say it's like a full 12, six, but it's really close. Um, where to righties, I'll let it run right to left, but to, uh, lefties, I make sure to get it under the barrel. So I have, I only call, I only say I have a slider, but I kind of have like two different variations of it. And if you were to, and, rate, uh, if you were to rate your change up right now, like what would it, where would it be? Uh, my feeling on my changeup is when I throw it, when I throw it good, I think it can be a plus pitch. I just um, don't always throw that plus one. Um, so it's just a matter of uh, consistency for me. If I can throw the good one um, 80, 90 percent of the time, I think it can be a really, really good pitch for me. Because sometimes um, I started throwing the changeup a lot more halfway through the year um, and it made – like being able to slide, hold the slider back a little bit more to the later innings and just throw that fastball change up through the third and fourth inning uh, was a huge deal. Um, and I got some really, really big swings and misses on uh, the change up when I was throwing it good. It's just a matter of uh, throwing it, throwing the good one all the time. Have you flirted with, um, I mean, to you were you mentioned that you were having trouble differentiating your changeup and your slider. Have you played around with uh, maybe like a kind of like a circle change, so that you'd have uh, more kind of run on your changeup going in the opposite direction of your slider? Um, yeah, I've goofed around with the changeup a lot. Um, last year in extended, I threw a forcing version that was at eighty nine ninety while I was sitting like ninety ninety three and extended. Um, and I actually had to tell the guys doing the radar gun that it was a changeup, so that didn't really work. <laughs> um, yeah, that was kind of embarrassing. I was like, geez, that's really hard. Um, the version I kind of throw now is like a two-seam circle one, um, and it's just still – I'm still gaining the feel on it. I threw – I think my lowest one this year was – I think I threw a, th- a few at 83, 84. It's just a matter of uh, um, just bearing it more. I like to get it on my fingertips and let it run. Um which is still a good pitch on its own, but that's really not the goal that we're looking for to get out of my changeup to uh, kind of move the bat speed off of uh, the slider fastball. Is it hard to, um, like, what's the, I guess, what's the hardest part of kind of learning the changeup? Is it, is it maintaining your arm speed um, or maintaining your uh, release point? Are any of those kind of struggles that you had to go through? Uh, the, the arm speed and, um, arm slot are definitely a big thing, big thing. Sometimes I find myself dropping my arm a little bit on the changeup. Um, and then I can keep my arm speed the same. It's just, like I said, it gets, it gets really hard and gets up to like 86, 87. So I'm just, um, pretty much the main focus now is just working on, um, getting the arm speed the same and having it slow down. Um, and that's why like I'm constantly working on grips and stuff. And I think the hardest thing with the changeup is, it's just, um putting the dedication in i think it's also um it can be hard to kind of when you only have a 20 25 pitch bullpen um it can be hard to kind of balance uh the slider change up i think there was like a point this year where i was throwing my my change up so much in bullpens i kind of started losing the feel for my slider and had to like kind of remind myself to keep the feel for that um so it's just balancing throwing all three pitches and just making sure you have the feel for all three so when you're in, in pitching now, like pitching a game now, do they kind of chart out how many changeups you're going to throw in certain counts just to make sure that you, de- you know, go through the development in a game of that? 
or do you still have kind of freedom to to choose your own pitches at certain times? Um, no, we 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 definitely have uh, the freedom to call pitches as we want. Um, I think there there was a few games this year where Coach Sai said you're not allowed to throw your slider until the fourth inning. I think that's like the most um, most that they'll tell us. And even then, um, if you start getting in trouble in like the second or third inning, you have you can go to the slider. Um, but other than other than just trying to uh, push us to throw more changeups, that's about the most they'll do with pitch calling. How did you do that game? <laughs> oh, in in Bluefield. Uh, my probably my best game of the year where my coach said I couldn't throw my slider until the fourth. I had like 10 K's against Danville. So it kind of worked out in the end. <laughs> Seems like these pitching coaches know what they're talking about sometimes, right? Oh, for sure. And like I said, I mean, when I, when my changeup is on, I feel like it can be a swing and swing and miss pitch. It's just kind of um, some nights I have it and some nights I don't where, I mean, like I truly feel like with my slider, I think like 90% of my games I have it. If, if, it's a very rare thing for me not to have my slider. So with your with your changeup, if you could pick one guy in the Blue Jays system or the majors in general or any level, who would you whose brain would you pick to refine your changeup? Just to you know get all those tips and those different maybe grip tricks or whatever. Who who would you pick to to just go over that with you? Uh. I think like overall, the, a good general answer uh, would be Estrada. Obviously, his changeup is disgusting. Um, but I think like the changeup that would most match mine. I've been uh, watching Stroman in the last few years. He kind of throws that two seam changeup similar to mine. Um, so I definitely either either one of those guys would be huge to uh, talk to you on that pitch. And he's a ground ball guy too. Stroman's a little smaller, I think. Uh, not with his soul. He's a big. A big Ooh, boy. You mean his heart? Yeah, his yeah. HDMH heart height doesn't measure heart. Josh, did you play against uh, Bo in high school at all? Um, the first time I met Bo, I actually um, didn't really know who it was, who he was, and then we were at the uh, we were at the Florida All Star game, and we ended up being I think we were on the West squad, um, and I remember him taking. I can't remember who the pitcher was, but like the whole team was talking about, he was going to go in like the first and second round, and I think Bo took him like 380 dead center, um, just destroyed like a 96 mile an hour fastball, and I think at that point it was like, oh, this guy's pretty good. <laughs> Who's the best player that you've ever, you know, thrown against in a game, or not in a game even? Um, in high school or minor league? Just, well, both. Do both. Um, in high school. To be, there wasn't really a lot of uh, the talent in my area was pretty lackluster my junior and senior year. If I was being honest, um, oh, hopefully none of them listen to this. <laughs> Shots well, none of that serious cool. shade. <laughs> a, a couple, a couple of the, I will, I'll correct that. A couple of the decent players uh, weren't in my district, so I never ended up playing them. Um, Anthony Turlin, I never faced him, but he was a guy that's with the athletics. He was really good. I played with him in travel ball. Um, and then I'm remembering Gary Zek. He ended up going to UCF or USF. And I think that was the, f I faced him my junior year. And I think that was like the first time a pro scout uh, saw me pitch. Um, I think like a couple, I think a Reds and a few other teams were there. And I ended up striking him out to start the game. And I remember, uh, I didn't really know who he was, but I remember like there, the Nap he played for Naples. I remember the Naples crowd kind of like gasping almost. And I guess it was like his only fourth strikeout in the whole year. And I didn't, didn't realize at all. And then for minor leagues, um, I'm trying to. Do you guys remember who the second overall pick was for the Giants, the catcher? Oh, Joey, Joey Bart. Bart. Yeah, Joey. I faced him uh, four times this year, and um, I kind of destroyed him. But I mean, obviously, like to talk <laughs> around him. <laughs> I, I met. I'll be honest. Like, I remember people were talking about him before the game, but I got him with my changeup four seam. I mean, I had him swing at a slider that bounced in front of the plate to be honest so that's awesome um somebody get obviously his, like i heard yeah somebody get his twitter handle <laughs> like we're totally blasting him after this <laughs> yeah <laughs> make that a sound clip joey bart calling you out i remember the talk before the game was like scouts have already see him as like a hall of famer but um he must whoa, have had an whoa, off day whoa. or something i don't know that's that's what i heard i don't that's that's just what i remember
Well, have you considered that maybe you're the Hall of Famer? Uh, that's I don't know. You'd have to you have to talk to all the prospect lists and stuff about that one, I guess. All right. Do you I'll, care about that? Stuff? Yeah. The one I've never paid attention to the prospect list, but I remember my agent mentioned something about Baseball America would come out with a Northwest League prospect list, and he was going to use that to give me a glove deal. Because just like all pitchers, I'm a huge glove deal, and I wasn't on Baseball America's top 20 Northwest Prospect League, and that was the first time I was actually pissed at a list. So you can <laughs> you can at them there because I didn't just because of them I didn't get a glove deal, so I'm a little salty about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll tag them for that one. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, I guess it's that probably has to do with just the round you went in and then not doing full season yet, but you're definitely still a sleeper at this point. Do you kind of feel like you want to prove people wrong? Like, are you, do you have a chip on your shoulder? Um, one thing I will say, I do totally – I wasn't a big name out of high school, and then obviously the year in Bluefield I had wasn't going to put me on any radar. So I, I definitely do get that list. Um, Vancouver is kind of like the first year where I pitched – uh, to my ability, so I get that. Um, but I think I've I think I've always been like that. Obviously, being being like a junior and senior and not committed to a college, and then um, not being a real big name out of the draft. I think I've always kind of pitched with a chip on my shoulder. Like I'm a really competitive guy, um, and I think that's definitely one way that I pitch for sure. So, uh, Josh, what what stats do you care about when it comes to developing yourself? Like, is there anything that you look at? Do you acknowledge advanced stats and sabermetrics at all um like fielding independent pitching or wins above replacement is there any of that that you kind of keep you know pay attention to or do you just kind of just go out there and try to focus on your your stuff um i I definitely do keep track of some of the stats like i said i pay attention to the ground ball stats a lot because the philosophy of mine is it's really hard to get hurt with ground balls um, because obviously eventually you're going to play bigger and stronger players where fly balls start to leave the park. So I definitely do take pride in my uh, ground ball stat. But other than that, I think I'm a big, real big feel guy. I mean, I just kind of go off how I felt that day. And then another mentality of mine with pitching is just if my team scores two runs, that's, I can give up zero or one runs. And if my team gives up or if my team scores zero runs that day, then it's my job to give up no runs that day. So that's kind of how I view pitching in general. Yeah. So you kind of like set goals for yourself in the course of a game. To right. Reach. Like, yeah. like a big goal of mine is, is to have my team score first. I think that's a huge thing. Um, I think if you, if you're the starter and you give up the first runs in a game, I think that's a huge, huge okay. value on not giving up the first run. So with the, you probably, obviously you watch baseball. I mean, kind of a, I'm going to start that question do again because that sounds dumb. Uh, the opener. What do you mean? Dude, dude, Anthony Rendon doesn't like baseball. I bet you there's a bunch of players that don't like watching baseball. So you can't really assume that. That's, that's... Josh, do you like baseball? Uh, <laughs> I do like to watch baseball and we do, I, we do, I do play with players that don't watch baseball. So that is a real. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very Told much. You. I I genuinely felt like an ass for asking that question, so thank you for throwing me a line. Get that garbage out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Rays this year were experimenting heavily with the opener, you know, starting with the relief arm and then bringing in a guy to pitch like the second through fifth. Is that something that you're interested in, like as a general tactic, or do you think that that is something that really shouldn't be around? Um, I kind of have mixed feelings on that. I think um, kind of just depends. On, I think if you have like three or four other pitchers that are going to give you a lot of innings, um, when their start comes, I think you can work with it. I think um, if your bullpen is going to have to pick up a whole day and then also be picking up starters in the third or fourth inning, I don't think it's really going to work. Um, like my gut said, obviously, like I kind of – lean uh, more towards the old ideas of baseball so like my gut says it really shouldn't work but um i think with the right bullpen i definitely think it could be a valuable asset but don't you hate watching games or like for example you watch the um the oakland and new york wild park wild card game like uh, i can't remember if i watched that one i think the wild cards were like right at the end of the season i can't remember how many i got to Oh, okay. Well, basically, Oakland 
use just the bullpen for the game. And I don't know. I, I personally really hate the direction that's going in. I like the, um, you know, I like having two starters going. Like, I, I get the utility of it, but. One thing I think uh, I remember another game I'll mention is the Brewers. I remember Gio Gonzalez uh, threw one inning and then they took him out when the Brewers were facing the Dodgers. Um, and I remember, obviously, they just went right to the bullpen. And I remember guys like Hader were okay, but I remember that was like the fourth time the Dodgers had seen a few of the other bullpen arms and they just didn't seem as effective as they did earlier in the series. So that's one thing I would definitely note about that. Um, when you see a guy like four times in a matter of six days, I think it's a lot easier to be on them, especially with bullpen guys where they only, where they only have like one or two pitches. That's a good point. So in general, kind of around the opener and changes that, that MLB is, is kind of making a little bit here and there. Um, there's recent rumblings about the shift. Do you think Major League Baseball should ban the shift? My philosophy on that, I think the less they can touch baseball, the better. Um, I'm really not a, I'm not a real big fan of banning the shift, and also I'm not really a big fan of uh, this whole like time of play. Um, I do get that baseball is a long game, but I think it's a long game on purpose. Um, I haven't really been a big fan of uh, them trying to change how fast the game goes. So no pitch clock? Uh, I don't like it. Uh, personally, I pitch really quick, so I don't think it would bother me, but I know there are some pitchers that take uh, take a while in between pitches, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. How about instant replay? Is that good for the game or bad? Uh, I, th I, I think it's a good thing. Um, I think any time you can get, especially in the play, I mean, obviously – uh, when it comes to the playoffs, some the games come down to some certain plays sometimes. Uh, I just think the I think they need to just get better at making it quick. I don't think the replays can take a long time. I think if they can get it to uh, only take a minute or two, I think it's a good thing. So let me ask you like a real question: um, Should minor leaguers get paid more? Uh, I think so. Um, I think it's absurd the amount we get paid. Um, and obviously you got to be real careful with what you say about that. Yeah. But um, obviously I was fortunate enough to get a bonus, but I've played with guys who only got a grand and you kind of see um, what they have to do in the off season or what they have to do during season or the lack of what they have to do or what they get to do in during season. I think it's absurd. Um, you know, seeing guys have to live off like two, two, 300 bucks every two two weeks is kind of an absurd uh, idea. Wow, it's that low? Uh, my first Isn't year... Isn't that in... illegal? <laughs> yeah, my... This year, in... this year in Vancouver, I got like 350 but last year in Bluefield, it was like... I remember in the G, you got 220 every two weeks, and then I remember in Bluefield, it went up to like 240 250 every two weeks. Which for me, I mean, like, pretty much one paycheck is just taken out by like my car insurance and different stuff, so it's like what you get... Wow. Like some other people that don't have a bonus and that kind of that savings. I mean, they literally can be living off 200 bucks. And I remember, uh, I won't say his name, but there was players in Vancouver this year who would literally be eating like peanut butter and jelly from the spread. And that's like all that they would be having that day just because they already have borrowed enough money from the parents and different stuff like that. So that so doesn't seem like it's in the team's advantage. To have, like you're basically forcing your players to eat ramen, like instant ramen. They're obviously not going to be, you know, fueling their bodies properly. And uh, then I think I think one thing that gets overlooked is you don't get paid in you don't get paid during spring training or extended. So, um, I mean, like you're in Florida, Tampa specifically, and you're in a hotel, and uh, you're pretty much going three and a half months without pay. And then obviously you have like. And no matter how uh, how little money you spend or how uh, careful you are with your money, I mean, you still need haircuts and you still need just little stuff like gas and different stuff like that. And uh, obviously uh, just little stuff like deodorant and different stuff like that. You just have to buy that stuff. And no matter how what you do, you're just going to um, be broke pretty much. Wow. You know, I, yeah, see, I, I'd, I'd always heard that, I mean, you know that minor leaguers get paid jack squat, but I didn't realize that you guys don't get paid for, like, extended spring training and, 
and shit like that. Like that's, you know, thanks for coming, guys. Like that's that's yeah. Cool. The the breakdown and extended is you get forty bucks a week, and that's for Whoa. um dinner on Saturday and then meals on Sunday. And granted, they do have they would pay us. There would be dinner at the hotel, but um, if you would have seen some of the food some of those days, you would have opted to go to McDonald's. So um, it's just real tough. Yeah. You so just... they spend this money for nutritionists and telling you guys how to eat and everything, and then they literally give you no means to go and do that. Yeah, it definitely is interesting. I mean, they, like they said, they lay out these diet plans for you, and um, some people don't have the funds to go buy some of this food because, like, They'll take you on Target tours. That's a local place by a, our hotel, and it's like they're showing you all like the different food options that are good for you. And it's it's the organic stuff that's a little bit more expensive. And it's like I don't have money for that. I'm well, certifiably de- depressed now, honestly. Yeah. 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 They they expect you to perform um, to the highest, and it definitely it's it's that's probably one of the biggest things is like staying in a good mental state. Um, I remember several days during extended in the last few years, you just are just ready to be done with it all. And you're just like, this is stupid. Like, why am I here? It would seem to me like that would be a massive market inefficiency right now. Like sabermetrics have done for the, the big league game. If teams, and, I, and this certainly is no, in no way blue Jay specific. This is probably very widespread through all the minor leagues, but give your kids the right shit to eat guys like minimum seems like a good plan yes yeah i mean i would think so um and it's real easy i mean just like when your whole mental state is in a bad place it's kind of hard to play good so i mean if you think about it like you think they would do whatever they can to uh support you but i don't know seems counterintuitive sometimes what they say compared to what they and yeah, minor leaguers need to form a union or something because they never get included in, in CBA negotiations is probably the big problem because, uh, you know, the players might bring up a thing to help out minor leaguers or, or players just entering the game. And that's going to be the first kind of thing to drop when negotiations come because they don't really care about players that aren't in the major leagues. Like they're not going to negotiate on your behalf. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's the I think that's the biggest issue. I mean, obviously, I've heard in the news there are a few things in court about getting minor leaguers more pay, but um, I think like one or two have already not been successful. So, um, yeah, it's definitely tough for sure. I was gonna say, I believe uh, ML teams or MLB teams just made the most money they've ever made, ten point five billion or something like that. I read in Forbes, and. Um, they should maybe spend some of that money on minor leaguers. Yeah, my 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 agent commented on an article talking about that earlier, and he said you got you got minor leaguers not making any money, but we don't have any money for them to pay them. It just doesn't make. Yeah. So when you see stuff like that, though, as a minor leaguer, like what do you, how do you overcome that? That like you said, you you have to be you know at your psychologically at the top of your game. So when you see stuff like that, being in the minors, knowing that they really aren't giving you the support that you need to, you know, do that. Like how, how do you, how do you get past that? I think that was something I kind of went through my first year. It was like mind boggling. I think honestly at this point um, it's something I've dealt with for two or three years and you kind of just brush it off as it is. And um, I think that's the biggest problem. I just think everyone accepts it for what it is and realizes it's not going to change. Um, and it's best just to not uh, linger on it. But um I remember like when I got my first, I remember when I got my first check at like 17 years old and it was like 200 bucks and I called my mom and I was like, what the heck is this? Like, (laughs) you're telling me like, cause I mean like obviously you have a bonus, but it is for the future and you can't spend that bonus willy nilly. Otherwise you'll leave yourself with zero money. And it's like, um, being an extended the two years, you have to spend your bonus. Um, you just, there's nothing, there's no way around it. You're just going to spend some of that money as it is. And I remember having several conversations with my mom and it's just like, this is absurd. All right. Wow. Well, let's, let's move on from this. Cause we're going to a very dark place. I don't want to get you in trouble with the Jays. Cause I know that all of the Jays brass definitely listen to the podcast in no way, <laughs> shape or form. Is that true? Um, so let's, let's, let's switch it up to something a little more positive. 
What do you think of Vancouver and Nat Bailey Stadium? Uh, I've said several times, I think this past summer was probably the most fun I've ever had in my life. Um, you go from... Bluefield was fun, but you go from having 50 fans to five to 6,000 on a regular on like a Tuesday, six o'clock game, seven o'clock game. And it's just like, wow, the support here is unreal. Um, and it was really cool to just be walking around the town and you see people wearing a Vancouver Canadians hat and it's like, Hey, um, I play for them. Um, so the, t- the, yeah, to the remind t- them. <laughs> yeah, the, the town, the town in general was awesome. I had a great time. Um, my host family was great. You had a really great setup. And we also had a great group of guys. I think um, literally the whole clubhouse got along. Um, so I think that was a huge thing. Josh, who was the uh, best player on Vancouver other than yourself, obviously? Uh, one one player, I think that there was a general consensus around the clubhouse that a very good chance of being a future big leaguer was Otto Lopez. That guy was absurd. Um I think in a matter of a week, you would see him playing right field, second, short, third. And I think his approach at the plate and his, his worth ethic, worth ethic, ethic is that through the roof. Um, he's just an absurd, really good guy. He knows like three languages. He communicates with the Spanish and English guys. Um, and he just, he was really good over, overall. Um, he was just an absurd player this year. He's also got like a real good baseball name. So he's got that going for him. Yeah, I've always worried about what my name would sound over the uh, over the microphone. I don't really know how my last name. I cannot wait to hear Buck Martinez say your name. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> cannot wait. How do uh, M C Gregory Contreras? Do you guys just call him Greg? Uh, we we usually just call him a Gregory, but um, we definitely played on the M C part uh, when he was hitting. We would definitely just yell out, "Let's go, M C!" But he he's another player that uh him and uh, I think Otto and him were the only two because I was the only high school guy in the team. All of our pitchers and all of our position players were either international or college guys. I was the only high school guy in the team. And I think Otto and McGregor were the only two guys that were younger than me, and both of them just McGregor has just insane raw talent. Um, I think if he can refine some of that stuff, he can be really really good. Time for another hard hitting question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Uh, I think a hot dog is its own category. I don't. Uh, I think uh, I think hamburgers and hot dogs belong to different categories. <laughs> why, why would you put that question, Nick? That's because <laughs> it's a it's a nice what transition. A, a transition, transition to what? Let's end off the interview by asking: Is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> no, Great work! End. Great that's work, that's... everyone! Hey, we're professionals. It's just a. It's just how you. <laughs> It's just how you transition okay. very simply. Okay, so you... obviously we've ran out of things to ask. No, so we haven't. I have like a hundred more questions. I want to know about gaming because you were playing CSGO when we, uh, oh when we were starting God. the interview here. Who's the best Call of Duty player in the J system that you play with? Best player besides me would definitely be Joe DiBenedetto, for sure. Me and him are definitely the top two hardcore COD guys. And who's the worst Everyone that plays pretty seriously is pretty good. Uh, Brandon Boucher and Jordan Barrett are a couple other guys we play with, and they're both pretty solid. Um, so the worst would Joey Polito. I know he's a big COD guy. He was really good. He was on, like, Team Red Bull at one point or something. I can't remember exactly. But, yeah, the worst player would definitely have to be someone that doesn't play because everyone that does play is pretty solid. So when do you have to report down to Florida this year? Uh, as far as I know right now, it should be February 28th unless I get called in early. So I think uh, late February and then March 1st will be our first day of action is what it was last year. And I don't think it's changed. Do you know you what you're level you're going, going to Lansing? At? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I assume Lansing, but um, you, you really never know. So you just, you just go into spring training trying to look your best and hope for the best. Are you hoping for... I guess he would be. That's a stupid question. <laughs> so maybe take, I'm just like, I'm thinking like, did you like Vancouver so much that you just want to stay at short season ball forever? Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, if you didn't have to go through extended to get to a bunch of the guys joked about this, if you didn't have to go through extended to get to Vancouver, I'd play there every year of my career. But unfortunately you have that two and a half months of extended that, uh, you can literally describe as hell. So, um, <laughs> 
we, I'm really yeah, excited. Sure. Really excited for my first year of full season and kind of see what that feels like. Also, the challenges of it, playing a lot more games and everything. So yeah. if you were to take us through your dream 2019 season, kind of lay it out and, and let us know what that would be. Dream 2019 season would be uh, get assigned to Lansing, um, pitch really well for half the year, however long, and then um, I think in a dream scenario, Dunedin's in the playoffs, and at some point I get to go help them uh, make a run in the playoffs or get them there at some point. I think that's like the dream scenario. That's, you know, level. that's realistic. That is pretty realistic. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, obviously I, I can say end the year in Buffalo, but that's a little little far out. Or you could just say end the year in the Jays. Yeah, that too. <laughs> just strike everyone out and then they don't have a choice. We really appreciate you taking the time, Josh. We took a lot of your time. No, you're all right. I appreciate it, guys. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Well, we'll, we'll do our best to... Uh, pump your tires wherever we can it's, and we're gonna we'll shame baseball america as well while we're at it we'll, we'll get you that glove deal man yeah, yeah. Let, let them know um, i mean rawlings i mean how does how does pitcher of the year not go on your top 20 prospect list for one league that he was in Just it's not like you're throwing 87 and putting up a good era like you have the stuff to back it up it really makes no sense yeah i i don't understand it either but well, i think they uh I, they put Hans Kraus on there. They pitched in the Northwest League for like three weeks, but you know he is a second rounder, so it makes sense. Yeah, I think you're gonna, like, from what we can see, like you're gonna play in Lansing, and everyone's gonna go, "Ooh." Where well, like, on a serious from? note, with Baseball America, because they get like the draft is so big for them, right? Like high draft picks will always be on their lists until they can't justify it at all. So, it might yeah, take I mean, a couple of years. Obviously, the draft means a lot, but I've played with guys that have gone undrafted, and I've played with guys that were second rounders, and I've seen undrafted guys perform just as well, if not better, than top round picks. I mean, the draft obviously has some meaning to it, but I think they overplay it just a little bit. All right, dude. Good luck in 2019, eh? Yeah. Hey. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.